This introductory lecture is on what will likely be the September-October public 2021 public forum debate topic. I say likely because, of course, it is subject to a vote, but it is what most of the camps are covering, and it is the better, despite its weaknesses, of the two options. The resolution is resolved the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should have substantially increased its defense commitments to the United States. Uh, in this brief lecture, I'll review the key terms in the resolution, the pro and the con arguments, and some key suggestions for strategy and specific things that you might want to research. As noted on this slide, I recorded the lecture on June 27, 2021, so shortly after the topic was released. Um, I'll likely record another lecture at the beginning of August once the topic is formalized, as I imagine that as people work on this over the course of the summer, uh, that more arguments than what I discuss in here will come to light, but this does really cover uh, the core elements of the topic. So let's begin by uh, looking at some key terms in the resolution. First of all, what is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, often referred to by its acronym NATO? It is a military alliance between 30 European uh, and North American countries that originally came into being as noted in 1949 um, and after the Cold War, which was the period of tensions between the United States and Russia, extreme tensions I should mention that lasted uh, between the 1950s and the 1990s and then cooled down and of course now we see uh, new tensions kind of expanded, NATO expanded uh, to include countries that were part of the former USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, NATO was really just the Western countries. Now, once, once Russia fell um, in the early 1990s and countries such as uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which are the Baltic states, became independent. NATO expanded to include many of those countries. As you can see on the right, there's a list of member countries in when they joined, with the Baltics being some of the most, the Baltic countries being some of the most recent additions. So we see this kind of expanding alliance through alliance throughout Europe and into Western Europe. One thing that's important to note is that when NATO makes a decision, right, NATO is the actor in the resolution. It is the expression of the collective will of all 30 member countries that take decisions by consensus. Now, the United States is in NATO. The United States is obviously the leading military power in the world. So this would involve a decision by the United States uh, to undertake action to expand uh, its defense commitments as well, though they would be through NATO. The United States would still be expanding its defense commitments, and you would have a lot of kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, increased military activity probably on the part of the United States as part of essentially as part of the action under this resolution. So I mention that because a lot of the evidence, you know, that may discuss particular commitments that the U.S. could take really even as part of NATO would involve increased U.S. military activity. And if you kind of realize right on Russia's border, which we'll move over towards now, what are the Baltic states? Well, there's really no definitional dispute as to what the Baltic states are. They really refer to the states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, and you can see them, right? They, they became uh, republics after the former Soviet Union, right? These countries uh, kind of had become part of the Soviet Union. They gained their independence in 1991. And I think it's important to see where they are on the map, right? They do, they do really border Russia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all right? And they border Belarus. Now, Belarus is a republic that gained its independence. Um, but unlike Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which are now actually, we'll talk about, kind of formally already part of NATO, Belarus is more closely aligned uh, with Russia, uh, they're heavily under the influence of Russia. They really kind of go to the drumbeat of Russia. And you can see kind of right on the other side, right, of, of Estonia, Latvia, and, Lith and Lithuania. We also see Poland, where the United States, right, Poland has kind of uh, joined the Western alliance, right? Right behind them, we have Germany, 
Uh, we have countries where NATO has expanded into, and the United States has really just recently decided to put a lot of troops in Poland, right? So we are kind of pushing up uh, close to the Russian border, but we do not yet have troops in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And of course, to the right of Poland, right underneath Belarus, we see the Ukraine, right? Where the Ukraine, Russia uh, invaded and took con uh, partial control of part of the Ukraine um, in, in uh, 2014. And we'll talk more about that later. But it kind of is important to get this map here uh, to see what is going on. And I also kind of mentioned the capital cities. And you can see them, you can see them right there on the map with the, uh, with the stars. Kalinan is the capital of Estonia, Raga of Latvia, Valenis of Lithuania. The United States has, uh, like I said, strong relations. And I mentioned the capitals because sometimes countries are referred to as their capital. So you may be reading an article that says, oh, you know, you know, according to Talanan or Talanan supports or Raga supports, you may say, well, who or what, all right, is Raga. It's just referring to the capitals of these particular um, countries. Now, the term Baltic states is very clear. Uh, I don't think it's uh, controversial. I haven't seen any definitions that list anything other than these three countries as being included in the Baltic states. Defense commitments, however, is a it's, it's, it's a much vaguer term. Um, I'm really kind of struggling to find anything that kind of identifies it as a term of art. It didn't conclude anything like a statement, um, making a kind of short term or strengthening that short term with a long term commitment. Could potentially include the stationing of troops, increased air defenses. Um, the, far, the best thing I've seen to refer to it uh, in the context of the Baltics is just a Washington Post article. Maybe that's potentially even where the resolution drafters came up with this. It says NATO's eastern flank members, right? Like we're, we're just talking about members on the eastern flank, right? Eastern Europe, like closer to Russia, okay, are lobbying for a long-term alliance commitment, right? Increased military forces in their countries, right? Authority for these countries to respond quickly. They want a very blunt and strong statement. They want increased air defenses, right? So I think there's two ways broadly to look at the question of a defense commitment. Are we committed to defending you in the event that you're attacked? In this case, that commitment already exists, Right. These countries are already NATO member states. And theoretically, not, not in theory, legally under Article 5 of NATO, if one NATO member state is attacked, all the countries must come to its defense. So at least on paper, you know, there's a debate about whether or not we would actually do this if Russia invaded, you know, Lit Lithuania with the United States risk a nuclear war with Russia to defend them. That's debatable. But we do have a paper commitment through NATO to NATO has this commitment and the United States has this commitment as part of NATO to defend the Baltics, right? Now, maybe you could increase this commitment by making it like long term or uh, maybe a blunt or like stronger statement, right? There's some there's some vague things you could do there with defense, defense commitments that I might call legal or rhetorical or stated things, right? Then you ha might have what you call material commitments, Right. We're going to maybe station troops, increase our air defenses. Those are concrete things. Are those like greater commitments? Arguably, arguably they are. And to be honest, I think we're going to have to kind of let the pro defend those or assume when we're con that the pro is defending those because we already have like a lot of paper and legal commitments. Otherwise, the topic just becomes all the pros kind of arguing for like a really strong statement or making this commitment like really long term. Um, most of the proposals in the literature beyond a couple of these vague references are for more specific things, which I will talk about in a minute. But there is kind of a, a question what defense commitments is that's a little more of a vague term, uh, certainly than the Baltic states, and it could become subject of debate. But now let's look at what some of the proposals are for at least uh, increasing defense, like I say, you might you might debate whether or not these are commitments or just specific uh, particular forms of action that really kind of strengthen the commitment. But uh, I want to kind of briefly go through these and all of these. Uh, there's evidence for each of these in the evidence packet. So what are some additional proposals? 
Uh, these are all things that I've read about like over the last few days. The first is that we would immediately respond that NATO, when I say we, I'm referring to NATO. Uh, okay, so if Russia invades, it's not like, well, we'll kind of check out the city, invades one of the Baltics. It's not like, well, we'll check out the situation um, and determine like if we want to uh, respond or that we'll eventually respond. It's immediately respond. All the major allies within NATO respond, not just some of them, right? So not just like Canada uh, or Germany or somebody's going to respond. Everybody's going to respond, including the United States. And we're going to come in with a massive response and really try to kind of crush the crush the Russians. So those might kind of all go things under our response. We could also increase and have regular NATO exercises in the Baltic states. We've had a few, but maybe those need to be regular or ongoing. One big controversial proposal is to more permanently station NATO troops especially from the United States in the Bal uh, from the United States in the Baltic states. There are some troops there from other countries such as Canada, but the United States as a as kind of a NATO member has no uh, troops permanently stationed there. And since the, like I say, the United States has the largest and most advanced or at least the most advanced military in the world, uh, the US stationing troops there could kind of maybe maybe expand NATO's commitment. Um, the reason people want to put troops there is not that you would ever have like enough troops to really, uh, you know, immediately stop like a Russian advance, right? You're not going to put like a hundred thousand troops in the Baltics, right? That would, that would certainly freak out the Russians. They're right on their border, which is obviously like a con argument, right? Imagine if China or Russia put a hundred thousand troops in Canada, right? But we're talking what the proposal is for maybe a modest number of troops, a few thousand troops, it would function as a tripwire. A tripwire is, is kind of a concept that says that uh, if you have a certain number of troops in an area, another like if you put like 3,000 troops, 5,000 U.S. troops in an area, in Russia invades and they would and they kill U.S. soldiers. They would know that if they killed U.S. soldiers, there would be a lot of support in the United States to like enter the war. Um, so the United States has this in South Korea. We have like thirty thousand troops in South Korea. That really, if North Korea attacks South Korea, most of these troops are positioned right at the, the northern part of South Korea. If North Korea attacks South Korea, pretty much all these troops would be killed. But the idea is that they exist, they know they would be killed, but it would kind of force the United States to enter uh, into the war to essentially avenge the, the death of our troops. So some people argue for putting a permanent number of troops in there from the United States to really essentially function as a tripwire. They also kind of support the, the allied Baltic state um, force integration, right? So that their militaries would be formally integrated with NATO. And maybe that would even kind of come under an agreement, a supplemental agreement to integrate those forces, right? That supplemental agreement it would kind of probably clearly be an increased commitment. Um, people also suggest that each ally should deploy its greatest capabilities, right? Not just some not military forces or technology uh, in the Baltics, but some of the best technology and capabilities that we have, that we should commit to kind of uh, having reinforcements to reinforcing back quickly. Uh, maybe we should provide missile defense um, to, to these countries, and maybe we should engage in nuclear sharing. Nuclear sharing means, right, that the, the countries that within NATO that have nuclear weapons um, would really, through the NATO alliance, make plans to conduct a nuclear war uh, with the Baltic states involved in decision makers. So, okay, they don't have nuclear weapons. The United States, for example, has nuclear weapons. So through NATO, we would meet uh, with these particular countries and really kind of engage in uh, nuclear sharing. So maybe the Russians would view that more credible because obviously uh, a cr more credible deterrent because obviously these countries, like if they're being invaded, might have a greater incentive uh, to use nuclear weapons quicker than the United States would. Uh, we could put a division lever, letter, level headquarters in the Baltic states and just kind of overall strengthen our presence and in integration via formal agreement with NATO, not just relying on Article 5, but again, a supplemental agreement, which will kind of probably constitute definitely a commitment. Remember our, our, our discussion of that term a bit ago. 
Uh, there's also discussions for common air defense strategies and sea defense strategies. C3I, that refers to command control and communications, the integration of that. We could uh, have a, a joint B3. B3 refers to the three Baltic countries and NATO like reserve force that was kind of there, just committed to being the reserves to go defend the Baltics. We could cooperate on cyber warfare, um, you know, which might become a contention in and of itself. We could, again, make our forces more operable. We could prepare and train to counter gray zone attacks. Gray zone attacks are like, you know, if the Russians just take a whole mass of troops and they invade uh, a country, uh, that's not a gray zone attack. A gray zone attack is like, okay, you have more uh, Russian influence in the country. You may have more Russians in the country that aren't soldiers or like disguise themselves as not being soldiers. Maybe there's more like Russian intelligence collection. Um, you know, maybe that eventually turns into an outright invasion. That's the fear. Uh, but the Russians have kind of, they actually, I think, probably are responsible for creating this concept of gray zone warfare where they don't uh, formally invade. Um, and then, of course, we have to counter Russian information warfare, just like it's discussed in the United States, right? Like Russian social influence in the social media in these countries, um, you know, Russian propaganda. We have to counter all this. Uh, people also say we should have uh, UAVs, unarmed, provide them with unarmed vehicles, drones, more night vision goggles, maybe have a rapid reaction brigade. So all those things just flipping through here again quickly are uh, things that I've seen in the literature on this that are, are kind of calling for increases. Now you can debate whether or not these all are commitments, right? Is giving a night vision goggle or a drone a commitment? Uh, Arguably not, right? Does that, in, or, or maybe it's part of a commitment. Maybe it fulfill, helps fulfill an existing commitment. You could debate that. Maybe it's a new commitment to give them technology. But as again, if you go back to the original definitions, now that you've seen some more of the proposals, right? They are kind of saying, well, you know, we want like a long term commitment, a blunt and strong statement, but also like air defenses, right? Or more military forces in these countries. Given that we've already, Given that these countries are already part of NATO, it's probably one of the few increases or, uh, you know, it'd be hard not to let the pro argue that these material increases are also increases of commitments. It would just leave very little left for the um, for the pro to argue for, or really even for the con to say like, OK, this is a meaningful change that we're going to argue is bad. Because as I mentioned, right, we already have significant commitments, right? They're already, okay, they're already part of NATO. Uh, and because of that, you know, if they were attacked, right, the, the alliance is at least legally automatically drawn in. Um, so given the previous discussion we just had, I don't have a lot to add on increase, but you can kind of see um, where we're headed there. Now, Let's look at the Russia, what are, what are the kind of the, the, you know, the pro arguments? I think some people probably come up with some different creative pro arguments. Like I say, we'll talk about, uh, you know, another lecture in August or at least through mid-July. But let's kind of look, just look at the core arguments. The core argument is that Russia is a threat. Uh, basically, Russia's military, if they wanted to, could invade the Baltics and just simply crush the Baltics. The Baltics don't really even have an air force. None of the countries have air forces. Um, they don't have any uh, real air defense systems. Obviously, the size, given the, the size of the countries, right, they're really small. They don't have meaningful numbers of people in the military. Uh, the Russians could just wipe them out. Now, why would the Russians wipe them out? I mean... There's a debate about this, right? What Russia maybe wants a buffer zone, right? For whatever reason, like you can say that, look, it's even all the United States' fault for expanding NATO. But the reality is, is that the Russians want a a, a buffer zone. They don't want all these, these uh, they don't want these countries in NATO. They want some geographic space between them and the, uh, kind of the Western uh, military forces. You can also make, uh, the argument that, you know, Putin, the I guess the president of Russia, is a rather aggressive person uh, militarily. Look, until Russia invaded 
Crimea, which was part of the Ukraine. Remember, the Ukraine became an independent country, right, when, uh, the, as part of the group that gained independence when the USSR fell in 1991. Um, until that, and, you know, Russia really basically first through uh, gray zone warfare and then through kind of a direct invasion and in, in, invaded part of the Ukraine and took control of Crimea. Until that happened, really, since World War II, countries have really respected borders. Um, even if you disagreed, people just kind of didn't invade other countries uh, and take over control of areas. But Putin has done this. And you, of course, can make the argument that Russia is historically aggressive. Um, there's a lot of theories about why, right? I mean, first of all, maybe countries just want to expand their empires. But other is that this concept of what called Russian encirclement, which I even debated in the mid 1980s, that if you expanded um, kind of uh, Western security, that that kind of competed zero competes like zero sum with Russia, and they kind of fear this. It, it's kind of we we called it Soviet encirclement, the Soviet Union. Okay, would be kind of uh, encircled by Western security forces, and um, you know uh, th they would fear a loss. So because of that, they're aggressive and always trying to kind of expand their territory. How might they be aggressive in particular? They could, you know, like I say, they could, uh, just a conventional land grab with their regular forces, just a former military activity. They might engage in cyber warfare. Um, which we've obviously seen more and more from Russia. They, like I say, I talked about gray zone warfare up a bit earlier. They could also block um, Europe's uh, energy supplies, potentially. Now, what are some key kind of ideas behind the pro? We want to say that kind of Russia is aggressive no matter what we do, right? Like the, the pro really wants to emphasize more that Putin is just aggressive. He wants to restore the USSR. Russia has developed advanced military capabilities. There's a good chance that, like, he would invade the republics and kind of expand, um, you know, and then potentially threaten Western Europe. You don't want to kind of emphasize what I was just talking about before when you're pro, right, that it's the U.S. military alliance that kind of backs Putin into a quarter and forces him to lash out. You don't want to make that argument because obviously the, the Khan is arguing for increased defense commitments, which could make that situation worse. But you want to really argue that Russia is kind of super um, aggressive and that we need more capabilities and commitments in the region to deter. You also want to say, hey, look, we are already committed, right? So it's like we've made these commitments, all right? So And now Russia like fears these, these countries are already in NATO, right? And they're right on Russia's doorstep. Right. So Russia kind of is already fearful, already encircled. So the question just becomes like, how do we deal with the situation now? Well, the way to deal with the situation now is to put more military kind of forces in there, either directly and permanently or through some rotation. Right. Um, through some more exercises and just kind of being more prepared to defend through like a deserve uh, reserve force. Right. That we need to really kind of get these forces in there. Um, in order to defend, in order to defend Russia, we've already made uh, this commitment. Um, and, you know, like I say, really kind of defend them as an, a historically aggressive power in Putin themselves, the Khan. So I think on the Khan, right, you want to kind of argue for a few things. First of all, look, we already have a lot of commitments, um, <laughs> right? We are at least at the very least by Article 5 triggered to defend them. Other countries have put forces in the region. We've provided more recently more military assistance in the form of weapons we've given them and in, in the form of weapons that we've sold. Um, NATO's engaged in exercises. We've done a lot without obviously kind of provoking Russia kind of like too much. Um, and you can make some arguments as to why Russia is kind of not a threat. I mean, you're not going to win those absolutely, probably not, uh, you know, not, not, you know, that they're not a threat at all, but they're not really going to take it and risk a war uh, with the Western military alliance for these three countries. Uh, then what you want to argue is that kind of more, a greater commitment and more military activity in the region uh, scares Russia, right? Maybe causes them to lash out and kind of hurts relations. And I'll talk about that. And maybe these arguments are a little weaker because even under the, you know, even if you did all those things in the 
and the, argued for all those things, which you may have to in the, in the list that I discussed, it's not really that, you know, relative to you know, the size of the U.S. military, I think now has around a $700 billion budget, right? It's not, it's not really going to take that many resources, especially since it's a NATO commitment and some of the resources would come from the United States and some from other countries. Um, you know, it's probably not going to cost that much or divert that much maybe from East Asia, but there's some evidence that kind of suggests that, you know, the United States doesn't want to make too great of commitments to Europe, additional commitments, because what we want to do is kind of focus on countering the threat from China. So I would, you know, and you could make a general argument about that. Um, so some key, are, you know, elements of the con strategy. You need to really be prepared to defend why is the increased commitment uniquely undesirable. You can't just say make a commitment to the Baltic states like scares the scares the Russians and like causes them to lash out and like attack everybody, right? Like we already have these commitments, but maybe why are putting U.S. ground troops there bad? Why is nuclear sharing bad? Right. Make the pro kind of defend all the recommended increases, which is generally how we debate in public forum. Right. They can't read a plan. They can't argue something specific. If this was a policy debate topic, it would be like a disaster. Right. Because the pro would just argue for one of one of these really, really small things and not the more controversial ones like ground troops or nuclear sharing. Right. But, you know, on, on the con, you want to say that, you know, in PF, the pro has to kind of defend basically all the proposals for increased commitments. And some of these are uniquely bad. We don't have ground troops there for really obvious, re the obvious reason, right? Is that the Russians would kind of freak out if the U.S. had ground troops um, at its border. We don't engage in nuclear sharing with these countries because we don't want them making like a decision, not that they could do, do it unilaterally, but really to kind of push the United States like into using nuclear weapons. The second question is, like, how do you minimize the status quo Russian threat, right? You can't let the pro win that Russia is no matter aggressive, like no matter what we do, right? You have to kind of say they're not as big of a threat. And if kind of we behave, they'll behave. Um, is Putin aggressive or reactive power, right? You want to kind of say that uh, they're more of reactive power than like one that's like inherently aggressive. So if they are aggressive, it's just going to be in reaction. Right. And why is it? Why increase? We've made big commitments now and everything is basically OK. So why do we need to take this farther and put like U.S. brown troops there or engage in nuclear sharing? Now, let's look at a, a few of these specific things. Well, the status quo solves. Right. Well, like I said, the U.S. is providing military sales and financing. U.S. military forces have operated there from time to time as like part of an exercise, but they don't stay there permanently. We clearly have legal agreements uh, to defend these states. Um, and NATO itself has deployed troops in the Baltics. Yes, those forces are not from the United States, but other countries that are part of NATO have permanent deployments there. Say so you can also say Russia is not a threat. Russia is reacting, right, to U.S. aggression post the kind of collapse of the USSR. They don't have the military or financial resources for a European invasion. And that NATO is basically going to deter them. They're not going to risk, just as you can argue the United States would not risk a nuclear war for the Baltics, neither are kind of the Russians. And then as kind of I've been alluding to, right, you don't want to provoke the bear, right? The bear refers to Russia. You don't want to make the bear angry, right? You don't want to put U.S. troops there. All right. The bear is kind of at bay. The bear is not attacking you. Right. Imagine you're in the woods and you see a bear. Right. You're going to kind of avoid provoking the bear. Now, if the bear is charging at you, of course, then like, you know, you're going to engage in ag aggressive actions. Right. Because it's your only hope. Right. Of survival. But kind of the basic con approach is that we're not being attacked now. Where there's no direct threat. There's no point in kind of provoking this bear, which is kind of obviously there, maybe a threat, right? If you encounter a bear in the woods, that bear is like a threat to you, right? It could potentially attack you. But if it hasn't moved in that direction, then you probably just want to maintain just some minimal defenses without doing anything aggressive that could potentially provoke the bear. 
all right? And I kind of reviewed some of those key uh, con concepts before. Additional con arguments. Now, obviously, NATO cohesion. NATO cohesion refers to the idea that NATO is stronger when all the countries are kind of acting together and agree. Now, look, if NATO is going to increase its commitment, of course, all 30 countries have to agree. That doesn't mean that all 30 countries would be excited about it. Right? So if all 30 countries are not excited about this, then um, it could still cause kind of some fracturing or tension within the NATO alliance. Um, there are arguments that when you put this pressure on Russia and the United States also pushing, putting pressure on uh, China, that these could drive them together into an alliance. It's probably not really the strongest argument because they're, they're already heading that way. There are so many other additional factors. Uh, but this has been an argument in policy debate and public forum debate before, and it'll probably come up. As I mentioned earlier, you could talk about the costs. It's obviously easier to research U.S. costs, but the, the additional spending that's there, the military diverting, maybe we should really be countering China. I mean, you could capture this if you have more of a lay judge, especially a conservative lay judge, into like a general um, America first argument. There are a couple arguments that I might just put in the category of dumb that you might be tempted if you don't know a lot about the topic to make that really aren't very good. You know, as part of the America First spin, you know, people say, well, the country, country should just defend themselves. Well, not really a practical alternative for um, uh, the Baltic states. I, I forget which one. One of the countries is the size of Missouri, right? So even if Missouri really like beefed up its military, they wouldn't be able to, you know, if they were on Russia's border, they wouldn't be able to defend themselves. So they said they don't even have an air force, right? It would take years for them to develop an air force and develop combat capabilities and like fully integrate them. So that's kind of ridiculous. There's also this idea in the literature that we shouldn't make uh, defense commitment, greater defense commitments because they cause commitment traps. A commitment trap says, and you may have debated this on other topics, it's like, well, we, if we make this commitment, it could really kind of force us into a war because we're trapped, right? Like, if we do respond, right, we're and if we make this commitment to the Baltic states and we do respond militarily, that could cause a war with the Russians. But if they don't, we don't respond, then they'll see us as a paper tiger and they're just going to kind of overrun us. That that is referred to as a commitment trap. The problem is, is that if there is a commitment trap, it's probably in the status quo, right? The, the status quo, we're already committed uh, to defending the Baltic states under Article 5 of NATO. And we've already kind of, you know, provided them with some weaponry and all these kind of things. So if anything, I think uh, this is like a stronger, like, pro argument to just say, look, we've already made a commitment. Um, it needs now to become a credible commitment and we need to make it so they don't attack so we don't get drawn into this war. Just a few things on the final notes. I know the PF debaters love statistics and quantification. I always kind of say it's the policy debaters nuclear war like PF debaters make fun of policy debaters for being obsessed with like nuclear war policy debaters. Well, they don't they know as much about PF, but you know, one thing after I've done doing, done doing a lot of policy debate, I realize, oh my God, like uh, PF debaters are just obsessed with quantifications, and you can quantify everything. But you're not going to find evidence that says like there's a four percent chance like Russians going to invade the Baltics, or like increasing the commitment is going to reduce it by like two percent. Like so, you know, as kind of designed by persuasion, you're going to have to kind of convince people more of relative risks than just to show them a piece of evidence at the end of the debate that says, like, this is like a 2% risk. Um, the evidence packet, as I mentioned, does contain all the, the proposal evidence, and we do have an annotated bibliography and some other developing resources at the website for our subscribers.